Well, here we are, the end of the summer and the last video of our AP Summer Unit 1 thing. So, uh, hi, hope everybody's doing well. Just wanted to let you guys know uh, how the class is going to flow for the first week here at the start of the video while I've got your attention. So, on Monday, we are going to start by going over the class syllabus. We're going to make uh, a Unit 1 map, and then we are going to spend the rest of the time, the balance of the time, talking about uh, your summer reading, The History of the World in Six Glasses by Tom Standage. Please bring in, if you haven't turned your work in, please bring in a hard copy of it, handwritten, typed, whatever, what have you. Just make sure that I have that copy in my hands by the end of the day on Monday. We're not going to go over a lot of the questions because most of them were just looking for information that you had read, and that's quite frankly to make sure that you read the book. We are going to focus very heavily on the flaws in Sandage's arguments, that last section of each of the question uh, sections. Sorry, it's early. I haven't had enough coffee. Anyway, on Tuesday, we'll be looking at Hammurabi's Law Code and probably going over some stuff from Unit 1 just to establish things. I will have a study guide for you. It will be uh, very vague because, quite frankly, it's an AP course and you've had quite some time to watch these videos. And then on Wednesday, you will take the Unit 1 AP test, and then we will roll forward from there. We'll go into uh, Unit 2 and uh, look at uh, classical China and Chinese philosophies and that sort of thing. So let's go ahead and get started with our last two river valley civilizations, the Indus River Valley and China. So just like Mesopotamia and Egypt and like Chinese civilization that we'll look at shortly, the Indus Valley civilization requires a river to function properly. All these early civilizations do. If you haven't put that down by this point, you should put it somewhere. All ancient civs used rivers. The IVC is not at all shockingly based upon the Indus River, and it's located or was located in modern Pakistan and India. You can see the Indus River Basin uh, on this map here. Uh, the IVC lasts about 800 years, 2500 BCE to 1700 BCE. It's sometimes called Harappan civilization because one of the earliest sites we discovered of it was a place called Harappa. You won't see that in newer sources. That's kind of an older source thing, but just in case you run into that in like a primary source, want you to know IVC, Harappan civilization, same thing. And India is actually a pretty great place to build a civilization. You have these monsoon wind patterns that basically make it so there's only two seasons, a hot and dry season and a wet season, because half the year the monsoon winds are blowing in off the ocean, and half the year they're blowing out off the land. That's an important thing to remember. We're going to talk about monsoons again in Unit 3, especially when we talk about Indian Ocean trade. You also have the Himalayas, the tallest mountain range in the world, up here providing a natural barrier against the possibility of invasion. At least, so goes the theory. Understand that we don't know much about the IVC. We can't read their writing, and because of that, all the next stuff you're going to see is guesswork. All you need to know here is we can't read the IVC's writing. The thing about that writing is it doesn't really resemble anything else. Everything we found is in fairly short snippets, and it doesn't look like cuneiform or hieroglyphs or Chinese. It, it doesn't really resemble any writing system we've ever seen anywhere, and unless we find some sort of Rosetta Stone translation device, which is pretty unlikely given how old this stuff is and how short all of the samples of it are, we may never learn how to read this. Also, there's a rhino. Uh, the best guesses that we have are that the Indus Valley Civilization planned their cities, that is, they laid everything out in blocks, it's not just random scattershot. They had sewers, open sewers, so you wouldn't want to live next door to it, but that's a heck of a lot better than, you know, going in your water supply, which is what the other civilizations were doing. They do appear to have been independent city-states like Sumeria, not a unified civilization like Egypt. Uh, priests are at the top, farmers and slaves are at the bottom. That's not that surprising either. And there do appear to have been trade links between the IVC and Mesopotamia, though those links haven't been firmly established. There's 
some stuff from both places in the other's archaeological sites, so it makes sense that they had some sort of trade link, though it's impossible to say how intimate that trade link was. As to what happened to the IVC, well, that's a great historical mystery. Uh, by 1700 BCE, most of the major sites had been abandoned, and the ones that were still standing were using much less complicated stuff. Pottery became less complicated. There's even less of that mysterious writing that we found. We're not sure what happened. The popular theory used to be that a group of people came through various passes to the Northwest and uh, invaded and destroyed the IVC. Those people, by the way, were called Arians, which is really weird and almost certainly wrong. And those uh, individuals then took over India and became the Indians that you know today. Modern theories propose that there was probably a change in the environment, maybe drought, maybe temperatures went up a bit, maybe temperatures went down a bit. But regardless, remember the building block of civilization is food. If the, your climate changes even a little bit, one failed monsoon, you've got a famine. There have been a lot of famines in Indian history. You'll see that too, unfortunately. So that's our going theory now. We don't know 100%, but since we haven't found like mounds of bodies and broken bones and burned cities, it probably wasn't invasion. It probably was a climatic change of some kind. So if the IVC disappeared, why have I spent some minutes of your life talking about it? Well, the important thing to remember is, A, there's no guarantee that a civilization will succeed or be remembered long after it's gone, and B, there's a strong chance that the IVC left behind one legacy. If you'll look over on the picture, I've circled the faces of this guy with yak horns. He's got multiple faces, and that's a characteristic that we often see in Hindu gods and goddesses. Near as we can tell, the Indus Valley civilization probably formed some of the foundational pieces of a religion known as Hinduism, the religion known as Hinduism. However, that's still pretty speculative. Uh, there are plenty of historians you can find who disagree with it, but with that said, the only possible legacy the Indus Valley civilization left behind was Hinduism, and if they did, that's important because Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world. Now let's transition to our last cradle of civilization. And China. China is the last of the four river valley civilizations to develop. It forms up somewhere in the ballpark of 2000 BCE. It makes sense that they were the last of the river valley civilizations. They're the furthest one away from humanity's origin point. China's big river is the Wang He River, also known as the Yellow River. It's named that because it has this yellowish tint pretty much from the place where it starts due to this really yellowy soil called Los. Los, which is deposited up at the head of the river, actually makes the river extremely fertile, and that's a good thing because, well, you would need a fertile river valley to establish a civilization way back in the day. Just like Egypt, just like Mesopotamia, just like the Indus Valley civilization. Rivers, they're important. The Yellow River is a very fertile river. It's a very good place to start a civilization, but for one thing, it is an extremely unpredictable river. Uh, even the rivers of Mesopotamia and of Egypt, even though they do flood, they do sometimes destroy stuff, that's nothing compared to the Yellow River Valley. So the early Chinese actually became experts at water management, irrigation ditches, but also dikes and dams to control the river and manage floodwaters. But even so, the Yellow sometimes looks like this. I mean, fairly obviously, this is a modern picture of a Yellow River flood. And if you read the caption down there, the three deadliest floods in history, no matter what metrics you use, have all involved the Yellow River because of high population and because of the river's just very unpredictableness. Now, China's history is organized a bit differently than other uh, nations' histories. Uh, Egypt had dynasties too, and you'll occasionally hear dynastic references made to like royal houses in Europe and other places, but in China, the dynasties are pretty much must-know information. We're going to look at the first three of them today. Uh, China's history being broken into dynasties, a dynasty is a chain of related rulers, and the 
length of time that China was ruled by emperors is really impressive. From 1600 BCE to 1911 CE, that is 107 years ago, China was ruled by an emperor. That is a really long time, and Chinese emperors claim the mandate of heaven. There are two vocab words on this slide, by the way, dynasty and mandate of heaven. And the mandate of heaven is that the gods, the, the powers that be in heaven, desire a just ruler to run the country. If a ruler is overthrown, clearly he didn't have the mandate, so it's okay to overthrow him. That's a pretty tenuous position to put yourself in as a leader, but it is a position that also means you can claim, if you are running the country well, that clearly heaven likes you. Also, if you would look, Chinese emperors got a sweet, sweet hat. I very much like that hat. Okay, the first dynasty in Chinese history, the Jia Dynasty, uh, is referenced a lot. You can see they're up in the Yellow River Valley. They are at least semi and possibly totally mythical. So truthfully, what you can put for this one is Jia Dynasty, possibly mythical. And they exist, at least historians think, that they exist to bridge the gap between the mythological past of gods and monsters to the actual early history of Chinese settlement. China was settled during this period. There were people there, but there's no evidence that any of the Jia kings uh, referenced in literature of China were actually real. They're not the ones I want you to focus on. The focal point needs to be on these next two. The second dynasty in Chinese history is... The Shang Dynasty. And the Shang Dynasty, yes, it's pronounced Shang, not Shang, is... They definitely exist, and the Shang are the building block of a lot of Chinese history. Metalworking, first of bronze, then of iron, takes place. The horse is introduced to China, and uh, China really becomes a scientific and uh, intellectual center really from the get-go. The Shang do all that stuff, and they are also, and this is important, they are the first dynasty that has to deal with horse nomads who live just to the north of China and will be a recurring theme in Chinese history. Spoiler warning for units two three, four, and five. The Shang also direct, uh, created the first Chinese writing. They did these things called oracle bones. You can see those right here. The bones are usually tortoise shells or bigger like hip bones of mammals. They are inscribed with questions and then burned to crack them in which direction the crack went was what the gods were saying. They're not history, but they do give us a good idea of what the Shang were worried about. Will it rain? Will my kid be a daughter? Will my kid be a son? Will he or she be evil? Those aren't, by the way, examples that I pulled out of thin air. Those are all actual things on oracle bones. The last one that we're going to look at is the Zhao Dynasty. Yes, it's pronounced like that, though it's actually sometimes pronounced more like Zhou. Don't worry about it. Um, the Zhao are the longest running dynasty in Chinese history, but what you need to put is the emperors held very little real power because they trusted local lords to run the country. It's basically Chinese feudalism, which we'll talk more about in our next unit. Eventually, these guys grow more powerful than the emperor, and there's a long-term collapse in Chinese history, setting a pattern. Don't worry too much about that. Just know that these guys create uh, this long-lasting dynasty. They create the mandate of heaven. They also are the first ones to give too much power to local lords, and everything falls apart. So by the 1000s BCE, the original River Valley civilizations seen in this convenient map are fading out. They have established their foundations, and they're now being replaced by civilizations that are more advanced than they were. And that's going to repeat itself throughout history. Old civilizations die off, newer, more advanced ones take over. What did ancient civilizations do? Well, the most important thing they did was they laid the foundations for all of the civilizations that followed, including our own. Uh, the taming of the horse, the invention of the wheel, metalworking, 
the baseline sciences, writing itself, all of that is started by these ancient civilizations. And really a lot of the stuff we do in our day to day comes directly from them. Indeed, most of the rest of history is going to consist of imperial states and later on republics and such modifying and changing and responding to the ways in which these old civilizations worked. We're going to see that a lot throughout this whole course, not just through the next unit. And I'm really, really excited to be here with you. So uh, looking forward to seeing you on Monday. And I believe that's all. Hope you learned something. Bye.